Clearly, someone also shot film footage of Glenn Seaborg standing in front of the molten salt reactor discussing the thorium fuel cycle. I cannot find this film. I cannot show you any film footage of an operating molten salt reactor. Only a handful of pictures exist. It's like NASA landed a man on the moon and then lost the film. This makes for an interesting communications challenge. I was driving home from work in April of 2006, and I was listening to a piece on the radio from NPR, and it was talking about the importance of proper branding, and that M was a bad sound, m, m. It was kind of a, they were saying that L was one of the best sounds, and M was one of the worst sounds. So I'm sitting there thinking about the MSBR, the mmm, you know, the molten salt breeder reactor, and I thought, hmm, molten, bad, salt, bad. I thought, how can we fix this? Well, instead of saying molten, we could say liquid, because it is liquid, and liquid turns an M to an L, and according to this, L was a lot better letter than an M. There are a lot of different kind of salts, so if we were more specific on the salt, we could say fluoride, which is a salt. It's a particular kind of salt. Breeder is a kind of generic term, and what we're really doing is we're using thorium as a fuel. So all of a sudden, there it was, LFTR. And one of the things I learned at NASA was you really <laughs> want your acronyms to be sayable. And if they have more than three letters, you want to be able to say them like a word. And it was like it just appeared. It was there it was, LFTR, lifter. You could say it. It was a word. I mean, as a marketing student, I have a lot different approach, but I still get excited. <laughs> hey, you know what? We need guys just like you. Any other marketing students here? I mean, this, you know, there, there's, there's almost a branding effort that needs to happen. How do you tell a story saying this is different. I used to think uh, when I was y'all's age, um, I was an aerospace engineer, I didn't know anything about nuclear. I thought nuclear power was dumb. I had no interest in it. You know, I was like, oh, old junk. Who would want to be into that? It wasn't until I learned about thorium and I realized these efficiencies were possible that I began getting really interested. Uh, you know, how, uh, don't do new coke, but what do you do? You know, how do you help people understand that there really are alternative possibilities out there? We need guys like you thinking about this. Uh, you can come to one of the conferences, talk to your friends about it, tell people about it. I mean, the biggest problem we have is getting the message out. And a, a guy got on yesterday, he said, you know, why don't we go buy a, a full page ad? And I said, because that costs a lot of money. Why don't you just go tell five of your friends about it? It doesn't cost you anything. And it's probably a whole lot more effective than getting an ad in the newspaper. It was only developed at Oak Ridge. So no other national laboratories really participated in, in this uh, development, which is not true about any other, about most other types of reactors where, uh, the effort was sort of spread and many people participated. This was really only in the Oak Ridge before the age of internet. I think it was sometime in 2006 when I discovered the Kirk Society and the from Thorium and learned about the molten salt reactors. Kirk Sorensen, he is what brought molten salts to the fore. It's pretty much all been on, on his shoulders and he should be lauded for that. It's outstanding what he's done. Kirk gave me some CDs and then he put them on the internet. Uh, and of course, to me, that was the game changer. That was an inflection point. Before, I sounded like a nut. And I couldn't point, unless you were physically with me and I could bring down, I have a copy of fluid fuel reactors showing the molten salt reactor in it. And the aircraft reactor experiment. Matter of fact, it has a picture and in the background is a step ladder. It shows you the scale. It was half the size of your refrigerator and it put out two million watts of heat. In and it operated in 1954. I wasn't even on the planet then. You know, we can have world peace and, and we, can, we can specialize in what areas that we're good at and, and trade with one another and, and not fight over limited resources. There's some chemical differences between thorium and uranium. Leached by water, U compounds were widely dispersed. And having been scattered far and wide, U compounds today are found as complex, generally dilute deposits containing mixtures of tetra, penta, and hexavalent uranium. Unlike uranium, tetravalent thorium, and it's constantly tetravalent, resists weathering. Thorium thus remained concentrated where it first wound up, within easy reach. Barack Obama, and I've heard other people say this before, they say that there is no silver bullet to the energy crisis. Molten salts are, are truly the, the best silver bullet f to, for serving mankind is it, in, it unlocks thorium economically and as we know thorium is so plentiful in the earth's crust it come as a byproduct for hundreds of thousands of years and in fact if we if we on purpose wanted to mine the granite just for its thorium we we're not 
going to run out of, until the sun becomes um, red giant. Alvin Weinberg called it burning the rocks. You could literally mine rock just for its energy content. Glenn Seaborg realized this in 1944, and he was absolutely dumbfounded with the possibilities of what it meant for the future. The molten salt reactor experiment has operated successfully and has earned a reputation for reliability. I think that someday the world will have commercial power reactors of both the uranium-plutonium and the thorium-uranium fuel cycle types. Here he was watching nations wage war against one another in World War II and realizing that this could be a complete game changer and, and, and change the entire energy outlook of the future. You know, EFT bloggers noticed that all these guys from China, some from graduate school and computer modelers started showing up on EFT, signing up from Shanghai, Beijing, and they started asking all these, you know, obvious questions about this and that and how to make the code work. And they were all modeling at the Chinese government expense, we could tell. Did you say China is building new yes. with electric tickets? So where are they getting the blueprints? Or are they developing a network? Well, I mean, they they probably got a whole bunch of stuff, the PDFs from my website. <laughs> you gone through your logs to see how many are coming from China? <laughs> it's been in the public domain for an awful long time. I just made it a little easier to get, you know. China announced to their national press of the existence of a well-funded molten salt reactor project. And it's being run by a guy named Zhang Ming Heng. He got his PhD in electrical engineering from Drexel University, he was educated in the United States. The really interesting thing about Dr. Zhang is that his father's name is Zhang Zemin, and he used to be the premier of China. So when I found that out, I thought, this is not some schmo here, this is somebody who's probably got some resources behind him. And if he says he's going to go build a thorium molten salt reactor, well, I tend to think he's probably going to do it. So ever since finding that out, I've been uh, really encouraging people in the United States and England and Canada and Japan and just about anywhere. I said, you know, it really would be a good idea if maybe we got going on this because uh, these guys are probably going to pull it off. And, you know, good. I hope they do. China definitely needs clean energy. Absolutely. And thorium will provide them clean energy for hundreds of thousands of years. But frankly, I'd really like us to be able to do it too. And I'd like it to be something maybe that we developed rather than that we go buy. We buy a lot of things from China already. You know, I mean, it's not as if we're not buying enough things from China. We are definitely keeping them busy. So, let, you know, let's, let's go develop thorium. And uh, that's really what I'd like to do. You know, one of the fun things about being mayor is that you come to the science fair to see the projects of some people that are close to you, and the next thing you know, you're standing on stage in front of a thousand people. It tends to happen. Hi, I'm Joe Willis, and this is my science fair project, Decarbonize Alberta, and this is just a dry run for science fair, which is in a week. What is this? You brainwashed your son into uh, being a proponent of the nuclear industry. Why? No. Why, man? Why? Uh, it's the other way around, actually. I was uh, the first critic. Joe Willis for Decarbonize Alberta. Wait, what? That's me? I got a thorium documentary, and I watched it with my dad, and naturally he fell asleep through the entire thing. And I'm telling him how thorium could save the world, and he's not agreeing with me at all. So I put it in the second time, and uh, he falls asleep. Yeah, I got the gold medal. I got the second consumer science award, and the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning. And although that one's name sounds like something for air conditioning, it's for air quality. I try to portray science as exciting and fun with Katie and Casey science videos. Casey is my miniature poodle, she's three years old. I thought that if we adopted the lifter, then we would have a much better future. If we educate people, then they will understand nuclear power and then they may become more supportive. You need this stuff explained in layman's terms so the average Joe on the street gets it the way the average Joe on the street gets the basic beats of an internal combustion engine. They made an information package that they tried to be relatively neutral to give to people and then ask their opinion on nuclear power. People were, yeah, I'm not really opposed, no, I'm not hugely in favor. When they did focus groups where they brought 12 people in, gave them the same information and then left the room and let them talk, then went back, pulled the people apart anonymously, 
the approval ratings were amazing. It's probably you at least get one or two people that knows enough that the other people trust that can explain it to them. So if we can explain it to better to the public, I think uh, that'll go a long way. For me, I think it's education at all levels. We talked about on the board educating uh, uh, candidates and, and people in political office, but I think there's also uh, the general public, um, make them aware of what's possible and, uh, and get them interested in the, the sciences at the lower ages and say, yes, I wanna be working on something that can power the world in the future. In addition to being an engineer, he really is an educator. He really is a, is a teacher. And he was beginning to spend more and more and more time mostly educating. This stuff, this is laws of physics stuff. I didn't invent it, all I do is promote it. He got a phone call from a stranger and spent probably 45 minutes on the phone really being patient with the specifics and tapping of my watch. We need to start today to get young people interested in this area, the molten salt chemistry, the metallurgy, the radio chemistry, even the civil engineering. We have to start that supply chain almost from scratch. Are there labs going to be integrated into this curriculum or is there any way to leave those out? Because I know that, um, that that was really the biggest challenge of getting the supplies to develop a lab for our curriculum. But still, any molten salt is going to require a furnace of some type. Most of the nuclear engineering schools have lost their operating reactors in the last 20 years. So they're teaching, it'd be like teaching how to work a, on a car with a shop manual, but no car, you know? So there, there's students learning how to run nuclear reactors with no, you know, nothing to learn on, just sort of reading about it. China has built a huge network of training reactors. They did it in like a couple of years. We did a journey to just about every nuclear engineering school and we said how would you like to have a salt loop it would just be externally heated it, it wouldn't be fueled so it couldn't generate its own heat but in every other conceivable way especially if you had neutronic stand-ins you know it would act exactly like a molten salt reactor would you can show the scientific phenomena the chemical and physical phenomena but without breaking the bank would that be utilized by other departments as well absolutely <laughs> you need an xrd basically to look at the crystal pre and post. Sure. And those types of, uh, of equipment span the gamut from biological sciences to geosciences, engineering. If they're gonna have a training reactor, they might as well have a Gen 4 training reactor, not a Gen 1. I mean, that's what they have now, down at U of I, that's being dismantled. MIT and Harvard, even they can't afford to build like their own telescope anymore, just by themselves. So Harvard and Berkeley and University of Chicago and MIT get together and they all say, oh, we'll pitch in and we'll share it. So, have you got all these people excited now? I hope so. Is everybody uh, excited? Salt reactor. Well, plus, you mentioned nuclear. Yeah. To anyone, and their initial reaction is nuclear energy. Oh, this is, there's no way we could learn this stuff. It's, I don't want to do that class. It's going to be too hard. I was really encouraged by in the Chicago meeting we were at. There was a number of young kids that were there. And, and I mean, like, well, I suppose I don't mean kids. I mean, like, yeah. college age. And how knowledgeable how they were. And how enthusiastic. And, you know, that kind of gives me hope. And I can tell you that is not going on in the conventional nuclear industry. We haven't produced very many nuclear engineers. I taught a, a class of senior level engineer students at Tennessee Tech in the fall of 2010, and there were 13 in the class. And, you know, they didn't even have nuclear engineering at Tennessee Tech. These were all mechanicals, electricals, chemicals. Um, five of them went on to grad school in nuclear engineering because of my course. I wanted to like write the NRC and say, You've told them the best situation you can possibly have is to be part of a massive decommissioning contract. I mean, how many people want to spend their careers doing that? When a nation dreams big and has fully funded projects visible to everyone, where a, a, a frontier is getting advanced daily, innovations attract smart, clever people. The, the, the prospect of innovation attracts them. Everyone feels like tomorrow is something they want to invent and bring into the present.